It's a blessing to welcome all of you to our live stream worship here on the fourth Sunday of Lent. In the description below, you will find a bulletin for today's worship, and below that, a link for our online giving, which goes to the bishop's dollar for during this season of Lent. We are blessed to have the Reverend Gail Goldsmith of Trinity Lynchburg to be our preacher this morning, and our musician is Martha Burford who is the organist and choir director at Grace Lexington. Our worship begins with a penitential order on page 351 of the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread, 
that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Here ends the reading. Let us say together a portion of Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Let all those whom the Lord has redeemed proclaim that he redeemed them from the hand of the foe. He gathered them out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious ways. They were afflicted because of their sins. They abhorred all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them and saved them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and the wonders he does for his children. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of his acts with shouts of joy. A reading from Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe him are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord, I pray for the preacher, for her sins are many. Amen. No particular sins, just the usual ones this week. I like to keep our Lent theme strong. Let's talk about the numbers reading today and how we see it quoted in John's Gospel. The snake, the camp, and the cross, three unlikely symbols of healing that speak right to our modern need for healing and prayers for a sign of God's presence. Three symbols of healing, but only one absolves us and send us out, sends us out into the world with purpose. In linking the snake in the camp and the cross, Jesus challenges our ideas of healing by turning the process inside out and putting our need for healing and our need for redemption in the middle of our public life, in the center of the camp, in the center of the church. Here's the background. Numbers is a multiple genre mashup, some genealogy, narrative, and law. But the steady beat is the tension between divine blessing for Israel's people and Israel's sin. Numbers details both personal and communal sin and describes how God speaks into that divide to say this, know me, love me, and follow me out of this trap. In the book of Numbers, the Israelites followed God out of slavery in Egypt. They are still on their way to the promised land. They're camping out in the desert, and they lose track of the vision and their purpose. They're stuck in a long-running cycle of complaint. God's people grumble and despair and get weirdly nostalgic for their life of forced labor in Egypt. They're saying things like this, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? So God sends venomous snakes into the camp. They're biting people. People are freaked out, fearful, and fighting. Gosh, I understand why. And doubting that God is with them. So they repent. They admit they have been living in the sin of despair and distraction from God. They pray for deliverance and safety. And that happens in an unexpected way. God tells Moses to make a bronze snake, put it on a pole in the middle of camp, so that anyone who is bitten by a snake may look on it and be healed. The snake, the camp, the cross, three symbols of healing, but only one absolves us. First, the snake. We all have something that has bitten us, poisoned us, and made us fearful. Something like the snake, something that we don't want others to know about something that we wouldn't want to have public, something that we wouldn't want to see right there in the center of the camp. I, I went to an experimental synagogue service once to hear a friend's Devar Torah message, and it was unexpectedly dangerous. The rabbi passed out index cards and told us to write our sins on the card. Okay, I can see where this is going. He lit a fire pit, he collected the index cards from the whole congregation, but before throwing them into the fire, he did the thing that nobody wanted him to do. He didn't shuffle the cards. Uh, he read them out loud, right in the order that he collected them as he threw them in the fire pit. So the, the flinch, the 
cringe just went around the room. Oh, it was like the wave at a basketball game. You could tell whose card was being read by the way that person looked for the exits, looked down and just shivered. When it was my card read aloud, I remember hoping I could magically disappear. We had all written these as if the list would just be thrown into the fire without everyone knowing, without ever thinking they would be read aloud, without thinking that our sins would be as visible as the snake in the camp. Having our sins visible to ourselves and to others does take away a little bit of their power. We no longer have to hide in secrecy and shame. And this is a great first step to repentance, but incomplete as far as the holistic healing of Christ goes. Second symbol of healing, the camp. I think the camp, all God's people all together, was supposed to be fun, or at least encouraging. And I hear this in all the ways we talk about looking for community. A gym, a workplace, a hobby, activist groups, a sports team, all of this can offer us community. And we might invite someone to come to church to us because it is such a great community. Look, I thought we were having a loneliness epidemic before the pandemic. We're gonna need all the community we can get. And yet, the church's mission isn't for us to be one of many communities you might choose between. No, we can have these other things and know that we have a cross-shaped path, a higher purpose and clearer focus. Or at our best, we do. At our best, at our highest, at our aspiration. The camp in numbers shows the idea of community as healing as all fallen apart, a mood of hopelessness, Oh my gosh, the snakes. Community is wonderful until it isn't. In a book we talked about in Trinity's Lenten series, Greg Jones and Celestin Musicura write in Forgiving As We Have Been Forgiven, Community Practices for Making Peace, about what it feels like in congregations when communities fall apart. They write this. We often fail to recognize in congregational life that the mere image of violence is what the ancients call melancholia. They might call it depression or more precisely, despair. This is the internalization of the effects of violence. It happens when we don't think we have the strength to overwhelm our enemies. It happens when we think Christianity equals being nice and therefore bottling up all our feelings of being wrong until we explode in rage. Community in the church is incomplete without practices of accountability and forgiveness, they write. And the way back on track is to practice these joyfully. When we remember that our grace and goodness isn't earned, God just gave it to us. We confess the things we did and the things we shouldn't do. We break bread together and we are freed to love people, to love our neighbor, especially the ones we disagree with, the ones we don't know well yet, and the ones everybody else is looking past. All of these guided by the cross. Finally, the cross. The cross is the fulfillment of the half promises of the snake and the camp. In the Gospel reading, Jesus tells Nicodemus this odd part of God's salvation story to foreshadow what will happen on the cross, using the phrase, lifted up, to, dis to foreshadow his own crucifixion. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, When I am lifted up, I will draw all the world to myself. Jesus removes every obstacle, our fear, our secrecy, and our shame. Jesus is saying that his healing and grace is right there in the open for everyone to see, everyone to see and believe in. You don't have to search it out, apply, or qualify for it. As soon as you turn towards it, God's grace is working in you. There's no shame, no secrecy, no, no condemnation. It isn't a problem to be looking for healing. No shame in admitting you need help and assurance because God has put the sign of your healing right in the center of the camp, the cross in the center of the church. Jesus gathers all the world to himself, 
gathering up everything that has held us back, shamed us, poisoned us, and made us fearful, and bringing under Christ's power all of this, breaking this hold on us by God's tremendous love for us. We might expect something more complicated, that there's some secret knowledge to be had, some technique to master, but Jesus is clear with Nicodemus and with us. God has always been making the first move out of love for us. Whether Nicodemus gets it or not, whether we get it or not, John 3.16 is clear. God so loved the world. Not because we understood. Not because we tried really hard, even. Not even because we're a great community. But because God loves us, even before we were healed and reconciled. And because we are so loved, we can look at whatever the snake in our lives is, whatever is poisoning us, whatever we need to be healed from, whatever Jesus is taking to the cross for us. And we can feel not condemnation, but healing and renewal in our life together in the kingdom of God, all the way into eternal life. Thanks be to God. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Loving God, in our faith we pray for reconciliation between the violated and the violent, that we, that we may rest in your peace, for generosity between rich and poor people everywhere, that we may share the abundance of your creation, for the growth of love between broken peoples and nations, that we may shape our common life as your kingdom, for mutual respect between immigrants and insiders, that we may welcome your image in all who come to us, for protection for the weak and humility for the strong, that we may serve others as you serve us in Christ. I invite your own intercessions and thanksgivings at this time, remembering especially those commended to parish prayer lists throughout our diocese. For all the joys and concerns of our hearts, that we may live with gladness and trust. Let us now pray in the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Bow your hearts before the Lord. Look down in mercy, Lord, on your people who, bef who are before you, and grant that those whom you have nourished by your word and sacraments may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, that was the Lord of bliss, who laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul? Oh, uh -huh.